Ladies and gentlemen, um, our speaker today is the Hamid and Christina Mukaddam, Director of Iranian Studies at Stanford University and a visiting professor in the Department of Political Science there. And he's also a research fellow and co-director of the Iran Democracy Project at the Hoover Institution. Um, Professor Milani was born in Tehran, <laughs> came uh, to the US as a student to earn his BA from Berkeley and his PhD in political science from the University of Hawaii. He then returned to Iran to start, to start teaching in the late years of the Shah era and shortly after the um, Iranian Revolution. Um, he came uh, in, uh, increasingly into trouble um, and after a few years of not being allowed to teach <clears throat> as he wanted, he decided to leave Iran in 1987, come back to the US first to teach at um, uh, Notre Dame University and uh, then moved uh, to Stanford. Um, Professor Milani has published widely on the culture and politics in Iran, on democracy and security affairs, and he has um, published both in scholarly journals as well as the, uh, in the press, Boston Review, um, Herald Tribune, Journal of Democracy, New York Times, Washington Post, and he has appeared repeatedly on um, radio and television stations. <coughs> Two themes, I think, stand out from the title of his many books. Um, one is the engagement with the question of modernity in Iran. So, for instance, in his book, Kings of Shadows, it says on Iran's encounter with modernity, um, in, published in 2005. Um, Lost Wisdom, Rethinking Persian Modernity in Iran, in 2004, and Modernity and Its Falls in Iran, 1989. Uh, <coughs> the other, topic is even more intriguing because it takes that question of modernity to the exigencies of individual lives. <clears throat> See, he has worked a lot on um, prosopography, most prominently in his um, recent work, Eminent Persians, Men and Women uh, Who Made Modern Iran, 1941 to 79, which came out in two volumes in 2008. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, the um, popular unrest in large parts of the Middle East um, has, at least for moments, turned the spotlight to the um, regime in Tehran again and maybe um, indicate a certain shift in the paradigms of our perception there. Not that many years ago, um, the radical secular modernism of the Shah was widely seen as the predestined path uh, of Iran into modernity. And its disruption to the um, uh, revolution and Khomeini um, as an aberration. More recently, we see the Shah's period depicted as the aberration and the rigid and ruthless authoritarian, authoritarianism of virtue practiced by the Ayatollahs as the true yeah, realization of uh, <coughs> uh, Iranian culture. So how can those dichotomy be rethought? How are these two seemingly radically different periods interconnected. The Shah and the Ayatollah's ruptures and continuities. Please join me in welcoming Professor Milani. Th thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Hagen and uh, Amber of the Center for Middle East, who's done now uh, all the labor of trying to arrange for these, these things take a lot of behind the scenes labor. So I thank her and I thank Professor Hagen and I thank all of you for coming. Uh, we had a guest at Stanford last week and uh, uh, he began by uh, recounting an anecdote. It was an interesting anecdote. He talked about the day when Michael Jackson uh, scored 69 points in one basketball game. And that was the greatest number of points scored and the television program was talking to one of the other players. Uh, and uh, they asked him, well, how do you feel about this? He said, well, uh, I am the person who played on the game that Michael Jackson and I together scored 71 points. <laughs> he scored two Michael Jackson's 69. Now, in retrospect, in future, uh, I can tell my grandchildren that I and Michael Clooney 
we're talking in the same room, <laughs> in the same building, at the same time, one floor different. Uh, I'm going to talk about, essentially, um, why we need a biography of the Shah, and specifically, uh, what are the ruptures and continuities uh, between him and the regime that uh, succeeded him. Uh, I'll talk about uh, why we need a biography much uh, more briefly. And I, I don't have my watch, unfortunately, so if somebody can tell me when we are about to run out of time, I would appreciate it. Uh, I don't. I was looking. So you'll tell me. Oh, thank you very much. That's very generous of you. A little fancier watch than I'm used to, but anyway. Uh, 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 I think uh, it, it is becoming uh, increasingly clear that uh, the fall of the Shah was a pivotal moment in the Middle East. Uh, many events that have since happened are now traced back to his fall. Uh, and I think the tumults uh, and the instabilities in Iranian politics over the last 30 years are also uh, still, in my view, the continuation of the same dynamics that overthrew the Shah. I'll talk about that a little more in detail. Uh, in the latter part of my talk. And nearly everything that has been written about the Shah, about the Shah himself, has been either a geography or a demonology. They have either made of him a hero that made uh, no errors, or they have made of him a demon that did not, no wrong, no right. Um, they either make him a lackey of the US, uh, uh, the Shah who was installed in power by the CIA in 53, or they make of him this uh, almost meta-historical figure that came and took a backward country and developed it. And the people were simply too stupid to recognize what a blessing he was, and they lost the opportunity. Uh, more or less, uh, the Shah's last book, My Answer to History, is in the latter category. That is the basic message of the book, that I did all of this good for the country, and the people were not strong, uh, appreciative. They were not smart enough to recognize it. And he uh, considers the only mistake he ever made was not use of force enough, and by keeping Zahidi in his appointment as an ambassador too long. These are the two mistakes he was willing to make with nine years, in, nine months in exile. So uh, neither of these two extremes, I think, do justice to the complexities of this character, who was indeed a complex character in my view. And the reality of his personality uh, and the reality of what he has done, in my view, offer diff often differs very much with either of these two extreme views. Uh, he was, in essence, uh, very much like Richard II. That's why the book starts every chapter with a quotation from Shakespeare's Richard II. Uh, Richard II was a king that was very uh, ambitious, very aggressive, very authoritative, and authoritarian when he felt in power. And the minute he was challenged, he broke down. And uh, much sooner than anybody anticipated, was willing to turn over the crown to Bolingbroke. Bolingbroke had come to take a piece of land. He got the crown instead. And uh, I think that's very much what happened in Iran. The Shah gave up far too early. Uh, and again, many of his uh, supporters would like to say that this was because he had cancer and he was taking medication, and these medications were causing him indecision. Uh, the medications were of a sort that caused indecision. They are of a sort that cause paranoia. Uh, they are of a sort that cause depression. And the Shah had a tendency to be paranoid, to be depressed, to be insomniac, to be paranoid. And we see all of these uh, very much in play in 1952, for example, uh, in his battle with Mossadegh. More than once, the Shah left, almost left the country. In fact, between 1941 to 1953, when he did leave the country, and he left the country again prematurely, long before any of his supporters anticipated, and almost doomed the effort to overthrow Mossadegh, uh, 
between that two period, this 12-year period, I have found at least five different instances where the Shah was on the verge of leaving the country. Uh, he was very much uh, a paradoxically a reluctant monarch. And I say paradoxically because he was a reluctant monarch. He was almost ready to leave before coming to the throne, and yet he stayed for 37 years. And he fought some very serious foes, people who really wanted it, wanted to end his power. So uh, he is a very interesting, I think, uh, complicated character. His fall is very much a pivotal uh, moment. Uh, one review of this book in the uh, Wall Street Journal begins by uh, claiming that the fall of the Shah is comparable only in terms of its magnitude to the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. Now, I, I think that's a little exaggerated, but that's the ballpark of the significance where people are, when people are talking about it, that's how significant they think uh, 1979 is. Uh, and in some ways, writing an impartial biography of him is uh, possible virtually only now because many, many of the most important documents you need to understand what happened have been declassified only in the last few uh, months. Uh, some of the documents, very critical documents, on the nature of Iran's nuclear program, for example, uh, became declassified as the book was already in print. I, I had to delay the printing of the book by four months, about. Uh, it was about a 1,000 pages of new documents that have been declassified from the U.S. Department of State, the Department of Ter Treasury, Defense Department, nuclear companies, uh, 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 nuclear agencies. And when you read them, they radically revamp the way we understand the Shah's nuclear program and the way we understand the U.S.'s relationship with the Shah uh, on the nuclear program. They completely contradict everything that the Iranian regime, for example, has been saying about the U.S. Uh, the regime has been claiming for the last 30 years and virtually has gone unchallenged that the United States was willing to give the Shah anything the Shah wanted, uh, in fact, encouraged the Shah to have the program, uh, encouraged the Shah to expand the program. But now that we have Islamic regime in Iran that is not following uh, the U.S.'s uh, lead, uh, the U.S. is making unnecessary uh, encumbrances. In reality, almost everything that the United States has raised with the Islamic Republic, it raised with the Shah. And for four years, they were fighting behind the scenes. Uh, and some very serious disagreements existed between Iran and the U.S. on the nature of the nuclear program, on the number of reactors Iran could have, the United States government essentially forbade U.S. companies from bidding in Iran for almost four years, for three and a half years. And to his credit, the Shah was unwilling to give uh, uncommon uh, guarantees that the United States sought. The Shah repeatedly said, I will not treat it like a second-class citizen. We want all the rights that the NPT grants us. And we now know that the NPT, or the Non-Proliferation Treaty, is a flawed treaty. It allows countries to go to the brink of being a nuclear state and withdraw without any penalties. And the Shah wanted to use all of that. And I'll talk a little more about the nuclear when we talk about the substance of the class. But these documents did not exist two years ago. Uh, and when I earlier wrote about Iran's nuclear program, the only thing that I had uh, that, ex that tended to indicate these tensions was two letters that Akbar Etemad gave me in an interview that I did with him. And the letters were remarkable in terms of the tension that existed. Uh, that two-letter hint is now filled with almost a 1,000 pages of documents. So in, in a sense, we can now really, for the first time, be uh, uh, in a position to write uh, an informed uh, narrative about uh, what happened in the revolution. E events of the last uh, few months uh, have once again made the issue of the fall of the Shah of uh, enormous relevance. Uh, 
unbeknownst to me, the book came out almost at the best possible time it could. All the delays that I had, uh, and the, it was a long delay. Um, in the mean, I was almost half finished with the book that I agreed to do the Eminent Pro uh, Persians project. It was a four-year project. Uh, but it was a project about the Shah's period, about the people who worked in the Shah regime or against them. And uh, I agreed to do it. But uh, the book was uh, delayed. It was delayed long enough that some in the Iranian community uh, actually believed that I was lying, that I was not working on a book. Somebody went on television once and said, he's been talking about this book for 10 years. Obviously, he's lying. He's not writing a book. Nobody takes 10 years to write a book. Uh, and unplanned, uh, the book came out at a very, very uh, appropriate time because comparison between 1979 and what was happening in Egypt uh, became very relevant, so much so that the first printing of the book, which was a large printing, sold out virtually in two weeks. The publisher was caught off guard. Uh, Amazon ran out. The publisher ran out. All of this had nothing to do with the quality of the book. The first two weeks, the sale, it was because of its top quality. And uh, that's why it's gone into several prints since then. Uh, so understanding why he fell, I think, has now become more relevant than ever. And these documents allow us to understand how and why he fell. I think better than uh, ever before. Uh, the Islamic regime in the last few months, few weeks essentially, has been offering a narrative that says what is happening in Egypt, Tunisia, all of the Middle East, is essentially a reverberation of, a reflection of, a continuation of what happened in Iran in 1979. That's the narrative they have been uh, offering. Uh, some others have been offering, I, I amongst them, a different narrative that says what is happening in the Middle East today is, in fact, uh, much more related to what happened in Iran in June 2009, to the Green Movement, than what happened in 1979. And furthermore, what happened in June 2009 is very much uh, related to what happened in 1979. If we understand what happened in 1979, I think we can easily understand why there is three million people who are willing to come out in the streets and say what happened to my book, which is a remarkable event in modern history of Iran, I think. There's never been an audience and demonstration that large. So uh, again, all of this is to say that it is a very important uh, event, and understanding it is, I think, very much uh, urgent. If you look at why Iran has been in the news for the last uh, few years, uh, I think we would all uh, concur that there are three issues that uh, count the most in terms of getting international attention for Iran. One has been Iran's nuclear program. The other one is Iran's democratic movement. The third is Iran's role in the region, regional role of Iran, uh, in the Persian Gulf, or in Iraq, in Afghanistan, as far away as uh, in Gaza, as far away as Somalia. Uh, all of these three issues, central to why Iran is in the center of attention today, uh, are issues that have their roots in the Shah's period. And they have their roots in an inseparable way in the Shah's period. Without understanding those dynamics, I would submit, we can understand these dynamics. And if you look at Iran's domestic problems, if you look at the tumults of the last 30 years, what are the uh, key issues that are at the core of the debate? Uh, again, I, I would submit that the three issues uh, are uh, not necessarily in the order of uh, importance, but they are the question of modernity and tradition, whether Iran wants to accept modernity or whether Iran should reject modernity and accept some form of tradition, uh, and a debate about whether modernity is Western and what defines Iran's tradition 
an incumbent in this. Second is the politics of identity. What does it mean to be an Iranian? Uh, to what extent Iranianness is defined by its Islamic root? To what extent is it defined by its pre-Islamic uh, period? Uh, and third is the question of democracy and despotism. To what extent should people be involved in decision making? To what extent, for different reasons, should or could uh, one person decide the fate of the country? Uh, I think these three questions are, in my view, the most important salient questions of the last uh, 30 years, Iranian cultural politics, Iranian political dynamics, Iranian encounter with modernity. And again, on these three issues as well, you will see that many of the things that are happening in Iran today uh, are, uh, to a great extent, uh, a reflection of what happened or a continuation of what happened during the Shah. So for both the paradigmatic issues that define Iran internationally and the paradigmatic issues that define Iran domestically, the period of the Shah, I think, is becoming increasingly clear, a pivotal moment of history. So let's take some of these issues and discuss them and see what uh, I have come up with in, in the book about them. First, the nuclear issue, uh, uh, easily the most discussed issue. Uh, as I said, uh, evidence, I think, shows overwhelmingly that uh, what we have hitherto been told by the regime does not fit the reality. Uh, and the regime has basically, the Iranian regime has basically changed this claim about the nuclear program two times. In the first three, four years, the story was that the nuclear program was garbage, was unnecessary for Iran, and that Iran was forced to accept it because the Americans wanted to sell Iran this garbage. Iran had surplus reserve, foreign currency. The US was short of uh, dollars and a, a trade imbalance. And thus, they forced their lackey, the Shah, to accept the nuclear program. Uh, and thus, Ayatollah Khomeini unilaterally decided to end the program as soon as he came, a program that by many reliable evidence was 75% finished. Iran could have had a working reactor at Bushe run by Siemens in 1981. It was 75% finished. It was destined to begin at 781. The technology was German. Uh, the design was German. The reactor was German. Uh, and it, it should have been completed in 81. The Khomeini unilaterally decided to completely end the program. And when they told him about the buildings and when they told him all of these things, he is reported to have said, use the buildings for uh, silos, uh, put wheat there. Uh, if you look at what this regime has done with the nuclear program alone, it is a remarkable breach of their fiduciary responsibility to Iran as a nation. This is a regime that could have decided, should have decided, to finish the program, and Iran would have had a nuclear program, a peaceful nuclear program by 1981. It unilaterally decided not to have it, and then it decided later to relaunch it and do it this time secretly, do it this time covertly, do it this time with German and North Korean and Chinese uh, technologies, with parts bought on the black market. And now, 32 years later, billions of dollars later in direct cost, and I would submit hundreds of billions of dollars lost economic opportunities. This is what the cost of the nuclear program has been for Iran. Yet, we still do not have the capacity to enrich uranium and have a reactor that works. In other words, today, 
the reactor at Boucher is deemed to be much more dangerous than uh, the possibility of having it started. They took out the fuel rods that they had put in, something that is very, very serious. The regime claims it's nothing, but that's absolute nonsense. Uh, the regime is now, as I said, 32 years later, facing serious fundamental technological problems, security problems, with something that could have had, could, should have been Iran's uh, 32 years ago. Enriching uranium is neither cutting edge science, nor is it something that any country should fight for. Uh, Iran uh, and NPT says and, uh, enriching uranium is an inalienable right of every nation. And this regime has behaved in a way that the international community has saw fit to try to deny that inalienable right. And Iran has insisted on this right at great economic cost and great political cost. One day, if there is a historical reckoning, and I'm sure there will be, there will be one day uh, historians, there might one day be a court that tries to judge the behavior of this regime on the nuclear program. And I think they will be, find, uh, they will be found to have been fundamentally misguided in the way they went about it, in both canceling it first without any national debate about it, without consideration, uh, without doing any kind of uh, analysis on whether it was the right to do this. Ironically, the only thing that is similar about this regime's nuclear program and the Shah is that in both cases, one person decided the fate of it. In 1972, the Shah unilaterally decided that Iran was going to have a nuclear program. They call Akbar Etemad to the court, and the Shah tells them, go design a plan. He gives them two weeks, and two weeks later, Etemad comes with a 13-page document and that becomes the plan for Iran's nuclear program. The largest investment by Iran government outside the oil industry was on the nuclear program. And it was decided virtually by the Shah alone, with no discussion in the parliament, no discussion of economists whether this is the right thing for Iran to do, whether in fact the price of gas and oil make it economically viable, uh, whether Iran should have uh, a plan, whether it should be in Boucher, for example, a place that is very much earthquake prone. After what has happened in Japan today, we realize the dangers of putting a reactor at a lethal uh, fault line. And they knew it. The documents show that they knew completely that this was a very lethal fault line. They, put five million extra dollars to retrofit it for uh, nuclear, uh, for pot potential uh, damage in, in case of an uh, earthquake. But the, the decision was made unilaterally. The Shah ordered on the spot for Hoveida to fund this multi-million, billion dollar program, and thus began uh, Iran's largest investment outside the whole industry. And the same unilateral fashion, it was ended. In neither case was there a national debate about it. In neither case, the center of decision making on budgetary matters, which should have been the parliament, was even consulted about it. Uh, and in neither case was it accompanied by a reasonable national debate of experts, by experts, to decide whether this is the right thing to do, and if it is the right thing to do, whether this kind of a technology is the right way to go about it. Uh, I just saw a reference to an article by a physicist at uh, Princeton who says that even if Iran wanted to have a nuclear program, the way they have gone about it is completely illogical. It is like using a technology that is 1940s technology rather than the 1990s technology, 1980s technology when they launched it. Now, they did this. They used this outmoded technology out of necessity. They were now doing it secretly. They were, uh, Siemens was no longer willing to uh, restart the program. 
they had to go outside. They had to depend on A.Q. Khan, Mr. Khan, who had a design that he had taken from his first employer in Netherlands and brought to Pakistan and was now selling and in the international market. And Iran was one of the uh, buyers. And um, Libya was another one of the uh, buyers. North Korea was the third buyer for this P1 uh, generation technology. Uh, so the fact that it is an outmoded technology is partly determined by the circumstances. Uh, and the reason they decided to go underground from the beginning and do it covertly is also partly determined by circumstances. They knew what Israel had done to Iraq's nuclear program at Osirak, and they believed that if Iran has a nuclear program, uh, Israel might well do, do it to it the same thing. So they decided to, from the beginning, do it covertly, to take it underground. In Natanz, they went 25 feet underground and built an, a building the size of three football fields uh, to allow for enrichment of uh, uranium. Now, when the Shah decides to do this, uh, very uh, initially, the US is eager to help. Uh, and in fact, there are studies done. One of them is a study done at Stanford that says Iran should have it. It makes economic sense. In fact, Iran should have 20 reactors. That was one of the initial early studies. Uh, but very early on, almost immediately, the US gets intelligence that Iran is making investments that simply do not make sense if Iran wants a peaceful nuclear program. Only a peaceful nuclear program did not make sense for the kinds of purchases Iran was making and the kinds of investments the Shah was making. Billions of dollars in France, in, in Germany, in South Africa, a, a company they set up with Israel, a covert, more or less covert company, Uniron, Iran, Israel, and South Africa. And when the uh, US gets wind of this, uh, of these at least dual use technologies, dual use technologies, meaning kinds of technologies that could easily be turned to military use if the government makes the political decision to turn, it in, turn a peaceful nuclear program into military. The minute they find this, and it's very early on, it's some, sometimes late 73, they put the stop on any sale of nuclear material to Iran. And this embargo essentially goes on till 77. Like Iran's nuclear program at that time, under the Shah and under Khomeini, when uh, the United States put the brakes on, there were other countries who were willing to make the deal. Under the Shah, Germany and France were very eager to jump into the market. German government immediately passed the law guaranteeing 100% investment for any company, nuclear company, investing in Iran. Because they thought, with the US out, they can get a bigger share of this market. And they did. They, they, they were the first one to sign a contract for Boucher. Uh, by 1977, there are different pressures. You could see it in these documents being brought on the White House to change its position. There are pressure from American companies. Westinghouse, for example, hires Mr. Helms, the head of the CIA, one time ambassador to Iran, as its lobbyist to lobby the government to change the laws. Westinghouse wanted to get into the business in Iran. Uh, the Defense Department is pressuring the White House to change because the Defense Department is being told, essentially, by the Shah that if you don't change your policy, if you pressure me too much on this, I'm going to put everything on the table. And everything meant, amongst other things, two very critical sites that the Defense Department and the CIA were running in Iran, monitoring Soviet nuclear activity. One of the most sensitive sites was a completely confidential site in Iran's Caspian coast 
the, placed all of them in what are called royal uh, hunting grounds so that nobody can have access to them. Uh, and it was very crucial for the US and very crucial for Britain. These centers were manned by the US or woman by the US and the British who also had a site. Uh, the reports never reached Iran. Occasionally, the head of these centers would make a visit to the Shah and make a perfunctory gesture at giving a report of what they had found. But this was an operation entirely uh, manned by the US and by the British. And the Defense Department was basically told that you might lose these privileges. Uh, suffice it to say, if you want to know how important these bases are, there is very good documentary evidence that the Soviet incursion into Afghanistan was partially at least caused by their belief that the loss of these two bases in Iran is so significant that they, the Americans, are going to try to find a place in Afghanistan to replace it and will make a preemptive attack. Americans will make a preemptive attack or do something in Afghanistan. The Soviets did not want to have that happen, and thus the preemptive uh, disastrous uh, effort. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, the State Department is pressuring the White House to reconsider uh, the deal. Uh, now, the Shah was going, as I said, full force for a wide range of programs, including plutonium processing, including full enrichment cycle. Uh, and the United States was making offers that today are now called the Russian model. The Russian model being that Iran can enter into an agreement with Russia to enrich uranium somewhere outside the, uh, Iran under joint management of Russian and Iranians. This is to make sure that the enriched uranium doesn't end up in a bomb. Exactly that same idea was proposed to Iran. At this time, it was to be Westinghouse that was going to invest. It was, at that time, a $300 million joint effort. And the Shah remained uh, very reluctant to sign anything that he said and this is an almost verbatim quoting. He said, if there is anything that other countries have not signed, I will not sign. I will not give any extra guarantees. But I do want the US to enter. Amongst other people who was entering uh, on behalf of the Shah was Henry Kissinger, uh, trying to convince the White House. And this is both the Ford White House as well as the Carter White House. So by mid-'77, both the Shah and the White House begin to soften their position a little bit. And they reach an agreement that would allow US companies to begin investing in Iran. But by then, the domestic situation is beginning to become problematic for the Shah. And the issue of the nuclear uh, is put on the back burner. And it never is picked up again, at least not by the Shah. The next time it's picked up is by Ayatollah Khomeini. And I have told you already that what has happened there. Uh, the second issue that has, I said there are three issues that have caught international attention. The second issue uh, is <clears throat> Iran's regional role. Here, too, you would find surprising continuities as well as some ruptures in the Shah's policies as well as in mine. There is a common perception that Nixon came to the White House in 1969 and developed the Nixon Doctrine. And according to the Nixon Doctrine, Iran was chosen to be the gendarme of the region. That was the dominant perception. Almost everybody accepts this premise. The evidence indicates that that is not the way Nixon doctrine actually happened. The evidence overwhelmingly indicates that long before Nixon had even announced his presidency, because remember, in 1962, Nixon lost the gubernatorial election. He went out saying, you don't have Nixon to kick around anymore. 
and uh, called it newspaper man a son of a bitch, and everybody thought that that's the end of his political life. Well, like a phoenix, he rose again. But before he rose again in 66, uh, in 65, as soon as Iran learns that Britain has plans to leave the Persian Gulf and end its military bases in the whole east of Eden territory from Egypt to uh, the Persian Gulf, the Shah makes it very clear immediately that Iran is going to replace Britain as the dominant military force in this area. Britain is very much against the idea. Britain tries from 65 to 68 to, in the word of one document, disabuse the Shah of the illusion, and I'm almost verbatim quoting them, uh, that Iran is going to be allowed to become the dominant force. Britain was opposed to it because Britain was very much invested in the sheikhdoms, in the United Arab Emirates, what became the United Arab Emirates, in Bahrain, in all of these countries, and all of the Arabs of the region were very much opposed to Iran becoming the dominant region. Saudi Arabia was adamantly opposed to it. Uh, but the Shah insisted. And when Nixon makes a trip to Iran in 66 in preparation for his uh, presidential bid, he has a four-hour conversation with the Shah at the embassy in Tehran, where he basically lays out what his plans are. He says to, the, to Nixon that you are overstretched. Remember, this is the Vietnam era. Uh, you are overstretched. This is the era of US having problems with dollars, uh, the euro pressure. This is the era where US ended the equivalency of dollar to gold, the end of the Britain Woods area. This is a period the US is under enormous international pressure. The Shah basically says, you can't do what you've been doing. You're overstretched. Uh, we will and can become the dominant force in this region. We will do what you would have done. Uh, you want to fight communists? We will fight communists. You want to fight nationalist radical insurgencies? We'll do it. And by the time Nixon comes, uh, he very much agrees to this at model and develops it into a much larger model uh, with the help of Kissinger. Uh, and Iran becomes the dominant force in the region. The Shah is keenly interested in developments in two countries at the time. One is Afghanistan. The other one is Iraq. In both, he sees the rise of Soviet influence. In 1973, the Shah be believes that Dawood is essentially a Soviet uh, agent. And he suggests to Zahir Shah, in 1973, that we will fly you back into Afghanistan. We will settle you somewhere in Afghanistan. You ask for Iran's help. We will send in a military and reinstall you in power. That's how far the Shah was willing to go to interfere in the domestic affairs of Afghanistan to stop what he thought was a Soviet incursion. In Iraq, in 1972, uh, the Shah believes that the Soviets are making very important headways. The Soviets had put a plan together that would bring the Kurdish minorities, the Communist Party of Iraq, and the Ba'ath into one unity, one un national unit to govern. The Shah was very worried that this will mean problems for Iran. It will mean problems for the West. It will be the first step of the Soviet entering the Persian Gulf. Uh, again, to his credit, from 1959, the Shah begins to plan a military that can stand up to the Iraqi invasion. Up to 1959, Iran's military strategy is designed essentially by what is called the Zagros line of defense. This is a strategy designed by Eisenhower. The idea was that Iran should have enough power to hold the Soviet incursion up to the Zagros line, use the Zagros mountain, and by then, the, the cavalry will come to help. The Americans will arrive to help. So Iran needs just enough to stop the Soviets at the Zagros line. 
after 59, the Shah believes the next threat to Iran is going to come from Iraq. Remember, there was a coup. The monarchy had been overthrown, and Qasem had come to power. This becomes redoubled in 68, when the Ba'ath comes to power. The Shah tries to organize a coup in Iraq in 71. They clumsily miss the coup. They had as their agent a guy who was a double agent for Saddam. And before they even make a move, the entire coup conspirators, a group of 41, were executed by Saddam Hussein. Iran had put all of its money into the wrong person. But the question, the, port, the port, important point is that the Shah was trying to destabilize Iraq. And in 72, again with the insistence of the Shah, there is a three-year program participated by the United States and Israel, both of whom joined rather reluctantly, less Israel, and certainly the United States was very reluctant. But they eventually joined in an operation, joint three-year operation, that sends millions of dollars to Iraqi Kurds to help destabilize Saddam Hussein. It, this interference in Iraq goes so far as Iranian regular forces entering into Iraqi territory dressed as Kurdish Peshmerga and fighting the Iraqi army when the Iraqi army was making uh, victorious uh, onslaughts. Uh, so the Shah was very keen in trying to have a friendly government in Iraq and try to have a very friendly government in uh, Afghanistan and was very much trying to be the hegemonic force in the region. Uh, now, in all of these three areas, we see the Islamic Republic more or less f trying to accomplish the same ends, but with one big difference. The United States in each of, uh, Iran in each of these cases is supporting forces that are anti-Western, anti-American, and in most cases, anti-modern. It, it is an attempt to truly challenge not just the United States, but I think even uh, more culturally important, to challenge modernity, to challenge the whole idea that Renaissance was a good thing that happened in the world, and that the Muslim world must try to find some way of implementing some form of modernity in Iran. So, uh, the ruptures are more in terms of the politics of what the US, uh, Iran is doing in these areas. But there are some continuities in terms of what the countries of interest are and who the contenders of this attempt are. The Arabs are very much uh, opposed to Iran becoming the dominant force in the region. Then they're very much opposed now. Saudi Arabia was a key foe in Iran's attempt to become the dominant force. Saudi Arabia is very much a foe now. Bahrain today is almost repeating, but in a much, much bloodier form and with much more potential devast potentially devastating consequences. The confrontation between Iran and Saudi Arabia in Bahrain in 1967, 1970. Saudi Arabia was funneling money into Bahrain to develop an independent Bahrain. Iran was claiming sovereignty over Bahrain. The sheikhs that were in Bahrain, the Al Khalifa, were very much reliant on both the British and the Saudis. And eventually, Iran agreed to a compromise where Iran would give sovereignty, give up sovereignty to Bahrain in return for the occupation of the three islands, the two Toms and Abu Musa, critical islands for the control of the Strait of Hormuz and of the Persian Gulf. Uh, so Bahrain was then an area of confrontation. Bahrain is today an area of confrontation. What has changed is the political dynamics. The structural similarities are, to me, uh, striking. Uh, 
Uh, let me not, uh, I was going to talk a little more about the domestic situation uh, of, of the three issues that I referred to, but I think uh, uh, I'm just going to talk about one aspect of it and then try to answer questions, if that is. Uh, when did we begin? I asked for a watch, but I forgot. 4.15. Uh, so maximum another five minutes, right? Uh, one of the most remarkable things about the Iranian Revolution of 1979, to me, is the coalition that overthrew the Shah. It is a very incongruent coalition, if you look at it. It is a coalition of all the forces advocating modernity, different versions of modernity. Marxism is a child of modernity. Uh, Iranian Democrats, from De Khoda to the National Front, were advocates of uh, modernity. The Pahlavi regime, in my view, was an advocate of modernity minus democracy. They wanted everything in modernity, but they did not want democracy, which was a very serious problem. Uh, all of these religious forces, uh, from Ayatollah Naini in 1905 to Ayatollah Shariat Madari in 1978. There is a continuous line of religious forces, Shiite forces, that are trying to reconcile Shiism with modernity. Ayatollah Naini writes this famous historic text that in the absence of Imam Zaman, democracy, constitutional government, is the best form of government for a Shiite uh, nation. Uh, a book, incidentally, republished on the eve of the revolution by none other than Ayatollah Talabani, who wrote a remarkable introduction to it, uh, which shows where he was standing in this debate. Talabani was very much in this line of democratic paradigm of religious sh uh, Shiism. Uh, all of these divergent groups united against one of the modernizers, the Shah, and chose as the leader the most adamantly anti-modern uh, force on the political horizon. Ayatollah Khomeini had been very clear and categorical in his opposition to modernity, in his opposition to democracy, in his opposition to constitutionalism. Uh, in his first book in Persian, he, he says, why would it be better to have a law composed by a bunch of syphletic men over a law in Quran composed by God? That was his vision in 1944. That was his vision in 1969. He had written all of this. He was very clear. The only part, the only time he taqiyyed, or khud'ed, as he said himself, and chose a line different than what his own record indicated was in the month before the revolution. In his Paris period, he had a democratic period where he changed virtually everything he had said before. But even then, to his credit, every time he changed his view, he changed it in a way that left him room to later renege. He always put a little clause, but nobody wanted to pay attention to those clauses. Everybody was looking for a leader who could fill this role, and Ayatollah Khomeini fit the bill. The Americans and the British decided late in October, early November 1978, that the Shah cannot stay. We can pinpoint to the day when the Americans and the British decided the Shah cannot stay. When they decided he could not stay, they looked for an opposition force that could do for the country what they wanted. Hold the country together, sell oil, keep the Soviets out, and deliver some semblance of democracy. Ayatollah Khomeini architected for himself a persona in 19, late 1978 that fit that profile. And he went one step further. He wrote a letter to Carter saying basically that this is what you want and we will give it to you get the army to stop supporting Bakhtiar, and we are the only force that can deliver what you want. Now, why did Khomeini and religion emerge as the only alternative? 
This goes back to the Shah's policies. The Shah believed, I think in retrospect, wrongly, that his main strategic threat came from first and foremost the communist, and second, the nationalist. And furthermore, he believed, again I think very erroneously, that in this battle, his allies are the religious forces. That's why from the day he ascended to the throne, literally from day one, he changed his father's policy of animosity towards the clergy. He began a policy of rapprochement with the clergy. He sent Zain al Rahnama to get Ayatollah Qomi to come back to Iran and gave him everything Qomi was asking for. Qomi wanted the back, 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 he got it. He wanted an end to co-educational school, he got it. He wanted Sharia taught at every school under the supervision of the clergy. He got it. Uh, and he demanded, in, in the tone that is remarkable from the prime minister, that the Shah has given all of these things, who the hell are you to stop me? From that moment on, the Shah allowed only one force to organize in Iran. That was the clergy. That was the religious forces. The number of mosques built in Iran in the last decade of the Shah's rule is the largest increase for the entire period for which we have the statistics. And this is not including the Hosseiniyas, the, the uh, Takiyas, the ad hoc religious places that were built during the month of uh, mourning. This does not include religious camps. This does not include the fact that they were allowed to build a school that trained students from K-1 to 12 with their curriculum. The only force allowed to train its cadres on its own were the religious. Madrasa Rafah. Shariati was brought back to, was brought to Mashhad University under the pressure from Sabak because they believed this is the antidote to communism and this is the antidote to uh, nationalism. Uh, he believed that the moderates, like Shariat Madari, might control this network that was being built. This incredibly networked, incredibly sophisticated network. But what he failed to understand is what many other countries failed to understand. The United States made the same mistake even after Iran in Afghanistan. Uh, in these organizations, in times of crisis, it's not the moderates that can win, it's the radicals that win. It's the radicals that are the most organized and the most uh, prone to use violence. And that network was used not by Shariat Madari, but by Ayatollah Khomeini. And when the country went into crisis, as it did, uh, he became the only alternative both the Iranian Democrats found and the US and Britain found. It was a choice all three lived to regret. Thank you. Yes, sir. My question is, uh, if you could walk us through the economic dislocations of the Shah's later years and how they contributed to regime change, and maybe compare it to trends in the contemporary Iranian economy, whether those are, are, are politically harbingers for change. Uh, I, I think there are two kinds of economic, in, in my view, the two kinds of economic factors that need to be taken into account. One are <coughs> the gross uh, inequalities that existed in Iran during the Shah. Now, the, the fact is, the statistical fact, I think, show beyond, in my view, any doubt, that Iran as a society had been uh, improved economically, that people in general, uh, all the statistics on GMP, GDP, all of these things, showed an increase 
in the last two decades of the Shah's period. But that's not, that wasn't enough. People were not in, happy that simply they were living better than their fathers were, for example. The Shah kept talking about Iran beating Japan, Iran beating Germany. The expectation people had far exceeded the ability of the Shah to deliver. And even uh, the modicum of ability to deliver that he had was very much compromised in 76 when the price of oil suddenly dipped. So in 77, you basically have the makings of a perfect revolution, of a perfect storm. The economy that was heating up, the Shah gave away $1.4 billion in 1975. Gave away, literally gave away. In grants to every place, like the, the, my most favorite is London Water System. <laughs> <laughs> Iran, they might need it, but they didn't need it to get from the Shah. Yeah. But you know, the Shah had been humiliated by the British. He wanted to humiliate them back. That's the only logic I can draw. I, I, I can't say for certain that that's what, but he gave away one point. And then, two years later, he was back on the market borrowing money. Iran had to borrow from Chase Manhattan $700 million. And, it, and because he was so embarrassed, he basically borrowed illegally. They didn't take it to the Majlis, giving rise to this enormous conspiracy theory that the Rockefellers engineered the hostage crisis because they wanted their $700 million back. This conspiracy was la large enough that there was congressional hearings about it. So one, the economic downfall made it even impossible for him <laughs> to do the modicum of. So, uh, the other thing, I think, the dislocation that happened, the economic dislocation that happened, is that the white revolution uh, organized the land reform. And it was a very misconception. First of all, it introduced the concept of confiscation. It began the idea that it is OK to confiscate the land if the country's economic needs demand it. One person opposed this was Eptahaj. From prison, he wrote a letter saying, don't do this. This is not, you're not going to have a capitalist economic development if you allow expropriation like this. But the result was that you had the largest migration in Iran's history, 3,000 year history, from the countryside to the city. And they converged on the city, and the Shah's regime did nothing to try to organize, mobilize, educate inculcate, train, socialize, whatever you want to call it. They converged. They uh, gathered in shanty towns around Tehran, in other places. They brought with them their religious values. And the only place that they could go for solace was the mosques that were being built. From 62, I have found evidence that the religious forces I named the name, Beheshti. Muhammad Beheshti, in an article he wrote in 62, he said, if we want to have a future in this country, we need to more mobilize a way to organize the urbanites from all classes, including the, mod the new modern middle classes. And they did it. They organized Hosseini Ashad and places like Hosseini Ashad. They began, and of course, they were helped in this. I mean, let's not just give them credit. They were helped in this by people like Al Ahmad, intellectuals who came out and suddenly discovered a new revolutionary component in Shiism that had not existed. It is not by accident that the man, you know, there's been one Shiite Ayatollah who has been publicly hung in Iran in all the Shiite history that we know. That's Ayatollah Nuri. And he was hung by the fatwa of three other top Ayatollahs, including the one I named. Now, why is it that 75 years later, 
an ayatollah who continues the line of Nuri has become the leader of the Iranian constitutional, the continuation of the constitutional revolution. Because 79 is essentially the continuation of 09. It wants democracy. Ayatollah Khomeini, who clearly had said, Nuri is my hero, is now the leader of this democratic movement. Part of the way was paved by Al Ahmad, the first person who said, Nuri was a martyr to freedom. The same Nuri that had said in all five that we do not want a constitutional government. We want Hukumat Mashru'e. So intellectuals did their part. Savak did its part because it made it impossible for any other force to organize. Khomeini's books were banned in Iran. These books that I told you that have these rather remarkable ideas. A book that says in 44 that why is it that a man like Kasravi is allowed to live when have Iranians lost their qayrat? Isn't there a single Muslim with qayrat, an honor, to allow someone like Kasravi, one of the most eminent historians, scholars in Iran, a year and a half, two years later, somebody with qayrat came and went to Majlis and chopped Kasravi to pieces. The same force that chopped Kasravi to pieces, Fadayan Islam, two, five years later, were praised in Iran's democratic parliament by forces close to Mossadegh and other nationalists. The person that had assassinated Razmara, who was the continuation of the person that assassinated Kasravi, was praised in the parliament as a national hero. They broke the constitution, interfered in the judiciary, let him go, and the speaker of the parliament went to uh, visit him and kiss him on his forehead and said, you're a pride of a nation. Those people who voted for this, and many of the top national front leaders voted for it, they are responsible for paving the way for this ascent. Question one is short. Uh, I know that your book's name is D. Shah, and you consider the fall of Shah the most significant event of current history. Why not the rise of Khomeini instead of the fall of the Shah, the most significant? Another thing in American uh, politics, when there are two parties, sometimes there is a spoiler. A third person comes, takes the some vote. And uh, I think you have said, and some others have said, that starting uh, Mashruti uh, uh, revolution, Mossadegh's time, Khomeini's time, there has always been a spoiler. For example, a two-day party, uh, Americans were afraid of two-day party, or the communists. What do you think, what country, what person, what force is a spoiler today that delays the f Fall of the uh, <clears throat> well, for, uh, the answer to your question is uh, very, the first question is, uh, why didn't we call the book The Rise of Khomeini? I didn't call it because that's not what the book is about. Uh, there are many other names I could, would have been sexier, would have sold more books, <laughs> but it would have been wrong. Uh, I would have been ashamed to appear in this public and uh, say that I wrote a book about the Shah and called it the Shah's sex life, for example. Uh, <laughs> that would sell. That would sell very much. Uh, and, you know, uh, and he had a very active sex life. Uh, and, you know, I could have tainted some parts of it, worked it to make it even more interesting. I won't get into it, but uh, <clears throat> those who have read the book would know. Uh, <clears throat> but that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to write an honest book. Uh, and the book is about the, the Shah. Uh, and it isn't even about the fall of the Shah. The book is about the Shah, his rise and fall. Uh, the second, uh, I, I, I don't know who it is that says there have been spoilers. I, I, don't, I don't know about spoilers. I think what has happened to Iran has happened because we as a nation keep making mistakes. 
it is us that has done this to us. It is not Carter. It is not England. It is not communism. It is us. Whatever has happened in Iran has happened by our hand, by our idiocies, by our uh, attempt to save our own reputations rather than saving the country. Uh, when Sadiqi came forward and tried to save the country, Sadiqi, who had been the most uncompromising opponent of the Shah for 25 years, he refused to even get a passport. He said, this is a regime that a coup has brought it. I don't recognize it. I won't get a passport. In 78, he saw the country in danger. He saw what was on the horizon. He was willing to forego all of his personal animosities. He was willing to jeopardize his personal reputation. One of the main forces against them was J.P. Medley, leaders of J.P. Medley, who issued proclamations against them, who went to him and told him, you know, you will spoil your reputation. And he famously said, my reputation is not for me to take to my grave. My reputation is for my country. If I can save the country, hell with my reputation. If we had a 100 leaders like him, if when the Shah declared the one-party system, we had five people who had the guts, the gumption, to say, your majesty, this is wrong. This is against the Constitution. You can't do this. What did they do? They competed one another with one another to become the first secretary of the party. <laughs> and then they come in exile and write memoirs and say, yes, I told his majesty, <clears throat> your majesty, this is wrong. You should allow democracy. <clears throat> the two-day party was, in my view, very instrumental in many damages to Iran's democratic movement. But the Tudor Party was essentially Iran's intellectual elite. They brought into their fold the Iran's intellectual elite. If 20 leaders of the party had done what Maliki had done, Maliki very early on saw that this is not a party created for Iran. This is a party created for the Soviets. He realized that the Azerbaijan movement was created under order of Mossadegh. I now have the, the literal command. It's a letter in 13 articles. Uh, Stalin says, create Fergay Democrat, call it Fergay Democrat. This is your budget. This is the number of papers. If 20 people had stood up and said, look, we want the Communist Party, but we wanted to serve Iran's interests, not Soviet Union, we wouldn't have had these things happen to us. Uh, so my sense is that the spoiler has been us, ourselves. Uh, it is we who have failed to understand what it means to be responsible members of a democracy. It means we need to put from our, it's not just taking, democracy is not just taking rights. Democracy is responsibility. It's responsibility of citizenship, responsibility of understanding what has happened to us. Uh, you know, these documents have been here for 30 years. Some of them have been here for 30 years. Some of them have been declassified recently. So it's in the genes? It's not in the genes. <laughs> I don't believe in the genes theory of politics. It's in our training. It's in our lack of civic responsibility. <clears throat> It's just hypothetical. US and England can get their mouth What would have happened? The question is, what would have happened if US and Britain had kept their mouth shut? Uh, US and Britain did not keep their mouth shut for one major reason. The Shah had, was falling to pieces. The Shah was demanding their advice, quote unquote advice. Someone gave me a tape of an interview with a journalist 
with the shop. A few months, uh, in fact, I think it's maybe shorter than a few months, a few weeks before his death. Uh, the text has never been published. Uh, and the, he showed it to me on the condition that I don't name him. But he allowed me to quote from it. And I have quoted in the book. There is a wonderful section. And clearly, this journalist doesn't really know much about Iran. So he asked the Shah, he says, when you saw these problems, why didn't you act earlier? Why didn't you bring the military, for example? Uh, he says, well, uh, I wasn't getting the right advice from the Americans. Uh, the guy says, well, uh, so what if you weren't getting the advice? Your country, why were you needing the advice of the Americans? The Shah says, well, you obviously don't understand diplomatic decorum. I thought the Americans were my friend. And I wasn't getting the advice. I was getting one advice from Brzezinski and one advice from Sullivan, and I couldn't decide. The guy comes back to him and says, look, uh, I know your majesty, but you were the sovereign of the country, not Brzezinski. So what if Carter Ford got to call you? <laughs> you know, the Shah didn't have it in him to manage a crisis. At times of crisis, he broke down. He almost broke down in 53. He did break down in 53. And the combination of Kashani, Allah, the American embassy, uh, supporters of Britain that were in Iran, and Bazaris, uh, Sardar Fakhri Hikmat saved them. Otherwise, the Shah would have been gone in 53. People don't know how much the Shah tried to escape in 53. In February 53, Mossadegh comes to him and says, I think you better leave the country. He says, sure, I'll leave. When do you want me to leave? <laughs> Mossadegh says, I'll bring your passport the day after tomorrow, and I don't want you to make an announcement. Leave quietly and leave with a car. He says, I'll do it. On the day he was supposed to leave, in the meantime, Allah finds out. And Allah tells the American embassy, Allah tells Qabam, Allah tells uh, everybody, everybody begins to act. Kashani, on the morning of February 11, convenes a special session of the parliament to pass a law requesting his majesty not to leave. The Shah tells Allah, I want to leave before they convene. I don't want them to come here and tell me not to go. I want to go right now. And it is Allah and uh, the American embassy and Kashani and f these guys who hold him long enough so that people can come. They bring about 10 to 5,000, I don't know, large number of people right outside the, part of the court. They shout and they watch out. They don't want you to leave. And he gets a new spirit and decides to stay. The same is on August. In August, 15, when he hears that Nasiri has been arrested, without saying a word, he gets on his plane and leaves, and leaves the people who were with him in that chalet in Kalardash. What would have happened if he had stayed? Mossadegh never told the Iranian people that the Shah had actually issued an order dismissing him. What if he had stayed, and next day gone in front of the public and said, I've issued a statement, I've issued, I've dismissed this guy. There is no parliament, there is Doran e Fetrat, and I have the constitutional right to dismiss this guy. There is a letter I have found from Mossadegh to the Shah that says, during Fetrat, there's, when there is no parliament, you have the right to make recess appointments. So what would have happened if he had appeared in a press conference, brought out Mossadegh's letter, and says, according to this letter, Mossadegh knows himself that I have the right to dismiss him. I've dismissed him. He has arrested the person that I have sent to give him the letter. What would have happened? We don't know, because he left. Now, all of us would like to either blame, uh, you know, Kim Roosevelt or Mossadegh for all of these things, but it is a very much more complicated issue. And each of us, as citizens of that country, I think, are responsible for what happens to it. 
Look at the, look, I, mean, uh, I want to go to another person. Look, you know, look at uh, today, right now. Everybody keeps talking about the role that the Americans have in this, the spoiler, Britain is a spoiler. There are two million Iranians outside Iran. There has not yet been a demonstration of larger than 20,000 people against this regime, which everybody claims in private to be against. 20,000. In New York, where there are 4 million Jews living, and Ahmadinejad, who is a Holocaust denier, comes to New York, we can't organize 50,000 people there. What role does the American have to do in the, all of this? It's us that haven't done it. And unless we understand that we are the only ones who decide, we are going to sit around and happily, you know, the conspiracy theory and the theory that there is a spoiler has one purpose. And I have found evidence that it came to Iran at the same time that opium came to Iran. <laughs> I really mean that. Opium smoking came to Iran mid-19th century. There was eating it before. There's a brilliant book by uh, a historian called The Pursuit of Pleasure in Iran, uh, Rudy Mati. Uh, and he says, Iranians learn how to smoke this damn thing in mid-19th century. It's mid-19th century that conspiracy theory, that's the Inglis, begins to come. They do the same thing. They give you false comfort. They tell you that you didn't make the mistake. Somebody else did. I'm sorry. You had your hands yes. up. Shall, shall we take one more question? And sure. Then we probably should leave Professor Milani off the hook because he has another appointment also. My name is Saudi Hassuna. I'm a visitor here, and I enjoyed your lecture so much. Very good, very informative. However, I have two. I have a question and a remark. Now I start with the remark. I was um, going to school in 1956-57, and in 1962, after the election of President Kennedy, the Shah had made a visit with his wife uh, to the United States. And the purpose of that was um, an aid requirement or something like that. And the Washington Post, there was a column in it published. I don't recall who uh, wrote that, but uh, it was in the uh, Washington Post. And I read it with the dean of students together who was having coffee at the student union. I brought it to his attention, and he said, Saudi, you're not a politician, you are a student. Anyway, uh, the article or this column, it said, well, look, he's coming to us for aid, and his wife is wearing a 25 million dollars worth of jewelry. Okay, well, that, that's the remark that I remember it now. But my question is this. Now, from the lecture here, I understand two things. Now, the communists, at times of Mossadegh, I was 14, maybe 15 at that time. Okay, and I remember quite a bit of the, uh, of whatever, what have transacted at that time. And um, of course, I understand from the lecture that the communists, the Soviet Union, had an interest and they wanted to support Mossadda. Now, the British and the Americans had also um, an interest. Now, who had, who had... It's the British word calling No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> who had the love and interest and the welfare to the Iranian people at that time? The British and CIA, and you know CIA had uh, a quite bit of a role in uh, reversing Mossadegh's uh, movement. And who has actually the love for the brown eyes of the Iranian people? Uh, was, it, was, it, was it the British and the CIA or the communists? 
question. Okay. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you very much for your kind words. Uh, in, about the jewels, I, I don't know what piece of jewelry she was wearing that cost $25 million. Uh, I don't think there was a jewel in the royal. That was in the... I understand that, right. Yes, I understand that. I understand that. But interestingly, uh, I quote uh, a letter from the White House. It's in the book. Uh, to uh, the court, Iran's court. Uh, you know, the Kennedys didn't want to invite the Shah. And there's a whole history there that I describe. The Kennedys hated the Shah, particularly Bobby Kennedy. Uh, and Bobby Kennedy hated him because Bobby Kennedy had two people who had told him about the Shah. One of them was Justice Douglas, the famous yes, little. But the Shah was in the United States. I know. If you have patience, I will. Whether he was if you have patience, or otherwise, but he was here. If you have patience, sir, sorry. I will answer your question. If you want, I will wait till you answer your phone, and then I will answer your question. <laughs> You're the only person whose phone keeps ringing, <laughs> and you question me for taking too long to answer your question. <laughs> Just one, yeah, I know, but yes, I understand that. Uh, and there is a button that if you push, they won't, it won't ring anymore. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the, eventually, they agreed to invite him. Uh, one of the letters they wrote to him, the Shah, they said, when you come here, we don't want you to wear any military uniforms. We don't want your wife to wear expensive jewelry, because it will create a negative Im image. So having received that letter, I personally doubt she, was, she would have worn 25. He had, I said, two, Kennedy had two advisors. One of them was Justice Douglas. The other one was a young man, at that time a student, by the name of Qutb Zadeh. Qutb Zadeh used to brag this family is very popular. <laughs> the number of rings the two of you have gotten is more than I get in a lifetime. <laughs> uh, oh, no, I understand. It's been a long hour. I just want to have fun a little bit. Both uh, Zadeh was the other. Both Zadeh used to brag about having the private number of Kennedy. And this goes so far that a senator writes a letter to the White House, actually and says, what kind of a government are you guys running? <laughs> this Pope is a two-bit hoodlum. Uh, to me, the Saudi Arabian ambassador in, in, in Washington was called so-and-so uh, Bush. Uh, yes, you well, you're me? moving, yes, you're moving forward about 40 no, years. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, the Saudi Arabian yes, but uh, allow me, yeah, allow me. to Washington Sir, I think you have overused your uh, prerogative. Uh, Next. <clears throat> uh, he writes a letter to, go to the White House and says, what kind of government are you? This guy keeps going around and says, I'm directly connected to Bobby Kennedy. And this is the incredible line. Those of you who believe in conspiracy theories, you would love this line. He says, he tells everybody that the Americans are going to make me a minister in Iran one day. Fast forward 30 years, and he was a minister. On that happy note, thank you. Thank you.